All right, well, hello, church. Ah, that was very good. That was good. I like that. Do I have to go to church to be saved? You don't have to answer that, but if you want to, go ahead. Uh, what I'd like you actually to do is, is you can put it down on your sheet in front of you or text it into the, my, our, the church's number, 269-694-6104. Got that? Okay. Uh, text it in. And because and, here's the thing. I get asked that question, and I wanted to ask you it because, well, I need to answer it, and I need to know what you think sometimes to be able to represent you. I know how to answer it, it, it with the word, but I want to know how you answer it as well. I don't really like that question. I don't know if you do. Uh, I started off today saying, hello, church. Maybe you feel like that's a weird greeting. That's the way the Bible talks. What is the bo- church according to the Bible? The church is God's gathered people. If you go to the, the next slide here, the church is God's gathered people. It's the people of God gathered together. That's the church. If you read the book of Galatians, for example, Paul says, to the churches of Galatia. Is he saying, to the buildings of Galatia? Is he saying, to the, the buildings in a certain place in Galatia? No. He's saying, to the people gathered in a place in Galatia. Paul also says to the church of God in Corinth. Is he saying to the building in Corinth? No. He's saying to the people gathered in Corinth. Or Jesus even says, tell it to the church. If there's a problem in the church, tell it to the church. Well, are we going to talk to the building? That's, that's no good. But that's the way we use the word in English, don't we? We say, do I have to go to church? So if you want, you've got that sheet there, that half uh, piece of paper. You can circle yes or no. And I encourage you always to take that outline home so that you can look at it later. But if you want to leave it here, and I know many of you do just so we can recycle them, uh, you can leave it here and I will flip through all of your answers later. And nobody has to know what time or what you answered. Do I have to go to church? Every time I hear those words, though, it, it hurts. It really does. It, it stabs me. There are people who ask me that question, and I know they're just trying to kind of trap me. They're ticked about something. They're mad at you and me and the fact that we are dysfunctional as all get out. They're upset, and they, they hope that I'll say something foolish, and they can just yell at me. That's what they want. Some of the people like that. But the vast majority of the people, most people, when they ask that question, do I have to go to church? I look in their eyes, and I can see it. They want to be loved. They want to feel like they belong. They want people who love them. They want to be forgiven. They want to be cared for. They want God's gifts. They want a church. And that's what God wants. That's why this lesson is is so important for you and for me today. I'm not going to sit up here and and dump on you or, or rail on you because we're so dysfunctional and Obviously, there's a lot of people who who feel like the church stinks as the church and we just don't do a good job. It is the number one reason people don't go to church. I don't need to dump on you. Everybody else dumps on you in life about that. So let's not do that. We do need to hear what God says today. We need to hear what Jesus says. That's why what Jesus says today is so important. It's so real. Jesus is in epiphany right now. He is revealing God's glory to us. And the church, we, the people of God, we're part of that. We're part of God's glory. That's why these words are are so important. Jesus has very negative, very bad things to say to the church of his day. And he wants something better for us. 
That's why we need to see here, starting in John chapter 2. If you've got a Bible in front of you, maybe one of these white and blue ones there in your row, you can open with me to John chapter 2, starting with verse 13, and you can hear these words. And you can find out in John chapter 2, Jesus goes to the city of Jerusalem. He went to the city of Jerusalem. He went into the temple. He found people selling animals there. He found people exchanging money. He got a little bit worked up about it, and he scattered everybody. He drove them out of the temple. This is an astonishing act. This is not a simple, benign thing. Not a boring thing. Man, you got to know how shocking this would have been. In the ancient world, there were lots of temples. Maybe you've been to this one before. You can go to the the next picture. Have you guys been to this this temple before? Parthenon, right, Uh, in Athens. Beautiful place, beautiful taste. There are lots of temples. Now, here's a little bit how temple life and religious life worked for most of the ancient world. Most places had no regular priests. There was no organized priests. So who got to be priests in most of the towns? They were normally the magistrates, the town officials. How corrupt do you think the place was if the same people who ran the town politically also got to tell the people at church on whatever day they did it how they should behave? (laughs) Right? We think we got problems. Here's another thing about the the ancient temple and religious life. There was was no unity or standardization. Every town, every locality could build and put up whatever temple they wanted. By some counts, there were hundreds of gods in the ancient world. They were all worshipped with whatever religious rites and practices they wanted. Now, you might have all kinds of issues with the Old Testament, but one thing I can tell you, the priests were standardized. They were not the same people who got to run the town politically. And they had very specific religious practices to participate in. They were religious practices that all dealt with one's life before God. They did not have to deal with paying taxes and other things. Nobody was walking into the temple in Jerusalem and making up some kind of religious practice to pay off your debt, your taxes that you owe the town. But those kind of things were frequent occurrences in the other ancient temples. And you probably know this, but some of the rituals in other ancient temples included sexual practices. Prostitutes were common in temples. Now, think about all of that, what I just said. Corruption, perhaps practices that encouraged, encouraged stealing, maybe even sexual activity in the temples. Now, you compare that with the Jewish temple. The Jewish temple was strictly regulated. It was in one place, a central location for the Jewish people. No sexual activity. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't come in there and say, man, look at how good we're doing, guys. We are so much better than the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians. We have just got this. He doesn't say that, does he? He comes in there and he chucks everybody out. It would be like Jesus coming in here and grabbing our offering boxes and throwing them in the trash and saying, what are you thinking? It would be like Jesus coming here and looking at this huge building and saying, what a waste. It would be like Jesus coming in here and saying, don't you realize when you pass offering plates around, you make everybody feel awful? I mean, it it would make us feel terrible, wouldn't it? And maybe you think some of those practices are things that we do. You know, if you, if you perhaps are not familiar with, with Christianity or you haven't spent as much time maybe thinking about these things, maybe you, maybe you think that some of those things, like offering, offering envelopes, right? Maybe we do those, you think, to make you feel bad, to kind of poke you a little bit on Sunday morning and say, oh, yeah, I should really bring something to church again. 
But do you know how many, how many times I've gone into somebody's house on Monday or Tuesday and the offering envelope is already sitting out on the counter because some dear soul on Sunday night said, this is the money I want to give God this week. And they said, I don't care if I feel like going to the bar on Thursday night or if my kids ask me to go to a football game on Friday night or if, or if I have a, a car accident or some other bill comes up, I am giving this money to God. Right? They have set it aside. And Jesus, Jesus comes in and, and he yells at people who do that. The temple was the center of the Jewish religious life. When we, we hear that when the, uh, when the temple was built, when, when Solomon built the temple, he said this is what happened. A dark cloud came down on the temple and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And then Solomon said, I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. The temple was the very place where God lived. The temple was, as one other New Testament writer has said, the temple was the divine dwelling place of God. It was the place where the Lord lived and ruled in the midst of his people, where he restored them and forgave them. A couple times a year, people would come from all over ancient Israel to that temple. They would offer their sacrifices and, and commentators point out to us the cattle, the sheep, and the doves used there, especially for worshipers coming from a distance, it was a convenience and a service. It was no different than what we do when we put offering envelopes out and say, if you want to use these, you may. They were a convenience and a service. Can you believe what Jesus has done here? He has said, I don't like this. I'm going to throw this all out. I'm going to trash it all. Now, I don't know if Jesus would have picked offering envelopes if he was here today. All right, I don't know if Jesus would have picked a building. I don't know if Jesus would have picked passing the offering plate. I'm not using those because I have some insight into God. I'm just using those because they're concrete, real examples of choices that we have made. Choices that we, right? We have made. And, but the thing is, we don't know. Maybe God would say the exact same thing about them. And how would that make you feel? Jesus was absolutely condemning, judging, rebuking these people. They had turned God's house from a place of worship into a place of buying and selling and conducting business. They dishonored God's name. They brought disgrace and shame on his holiness. It's not hard to see what he wanted when you read the next little phrase here. Did you read verse 17? It says, zeal for your house will consume me. The disciples watched what Jesus did and they, they realized that he was consuming this house. Now, maybe, maybe some of you like fire. You like fire? I, I would guess many of you like to put up a, a campfire on a, on a Friday night, but have you ever seen, watched a wildfire? There's a, a huge difference, isn't there, between a campfire and a wildfire. They're both fires, aren't they? They're the, the exact same thing, essentially. But one fire, you control, it makes you warm, it makes you happy, it keeps you safe. The other fire, a consuming fire, a wildfire, you're not safe from it at all. When God describes himself, do you know what he says he's like? Exodus chapter 24, he says, To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire. God is perfect. God is holy. That does not just mean that he is a nice fire, tame to keep you warm and safe and happy in life. He is a destroying, 
consuming, devouring fire. He will chew up everything and anything that is not perfect in this world. He will eat it all up. That's what this means. And what Jesus did in the temple was to consume and devour and eat up everything in his path. Everything that was not perfect. Everything that was not holy. Everything that was not good. But even more than that, even more than that, it showed that the temple was the one place, even the temple, where you could not get to God on your own. Have any of you ever been near a wildfire? It's a terrifying thing, isn't it? It's an absolutely frightening and terrifying thing to, to watch a wildfire rip through the mountains and be carried by the winds down the hill. Where can you hide and be safe from a wildfire? There's only two things you can do. You get in your car and you drive away as fast as you can and you hope that you can outrun it. Or what else do you do? You build a fire break, right? And you make the fire burn up all the land back into the fire so that you can hide into the fire. You can hide under it, right? That's the only way is to save, be safe from a, a wildfire. Do you see what Jesus said about himself? He didn't just say that he was a consuming fire. He also said in this lesson, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. That's what verse 19 says. Jump ahead, right? Look at that. Verse 19, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is saying, I will get consumed by the fire so that you can be safe. I am the one place that where you can hide that will absolutely protect you. That's the true point of this lesson. And he write, one of the great commentators on the New Testament, he says, in this lesson, Jesus is absolutely condemning many of the practices of the temple. But more than that, he is saying, the temple has now been replaced. I am the true temple, and I have come among you so that you can have safety. You know, every other religion says, go build a temple. Jesus says, I am the temple. Every other religion says, go do certain things so that you can get right with God. Jesus says, I am doing things so that you are right with God. Every other religion says, man, if you bow low enough, maybe you can keep God happy with your life and you'll finally be safe. Jesus says, I will keep you safe from all of the dangers of hell and judgment and wrath and everything else that could come bad on you. Friends, that's the gospel. That there is one place for you and I above everything else where we can actually be safe in this life and get close to God. Jesus Jesus gathers this people to himself so that you and I can be close to God. So how do we answer that question, do I have to go to church? Well, I always say no first. No, because there's no Bible passage that says you have to go to church. You're not going to find it. You will find passages that say worship God, serve him only. But no Bible passage that says that you have to go to church. But then you have to say yes. You have to be part of God's church. But we think about it all wrong. Let me give you a comparison so you can think about it. How many of you are part of clubs? Right, you don't have to wait, raise your hands. Just think to yourself, how many of you are part of some club, some organization? You probably get some small benefits out of being part of that club. But if you don't pay your dues, are you still part of the club? No. And does the club do things for you? Does it benefit you more than what you put into the club? Probably not. You probably put way more effort into the club than you get out of the club. Now, compare a club, compare being in a club to being in a marriage. I know, right? Another marriage picture, right? But think about this. What happens to you the instant that you put on a wedding ring? The instant that you put on that ring and you are married... I can guarantee you, you get more out of it than you put in. Now, there might be some of you who you feel like you're getting the short end of the stick in your marriage. And if you're getting the short end of the stick, I'm sorry. I'd be glad to talk to you about that. 
But I can tell you for a fact, I get out of my marriage way more than I put into my marriage. And more importantly, I am married whether I like it or not. I mean to say, there are some days where I probably don't behave very well like I belong in a marriage. I'm still married. There are some days where some people are separated, but they're still married. They are part of that marriage whether they like it or not. The same thing is true of being in God's church. The instant you say, Jesus is my Savior and Lord, you are part of the church whether you like it or not. It's not like being in a club where if you forget to pay your dues or you forget to show up or you don't put in enough time and enough energy and enough effort, you don't get anything out of it. When you say, I believe in Jesus as my Savior and Lord, that second, you are part of the church. It is a fact. It is a spiritual reality. And you are gaining more from it than you have ever put into it. You are forgiven. You are blessed. Heaven is yours. God is your Father. You are loved. You have a place to belong. Man, what else do you want in life? The only question is, will you live like you're married? Will you live like you're loved? Will you live like you're forgiven? Will you enjoy the house? Will you come home? Will you be part of the family? Friends, friends, every one of you who says, I believe in Jesus, you are part of the church. You are one of God's children. You belong in this house. Jesus has gathered you here. Will you live that way? We are part of that family. Because Jesus has gathered us. So let's pray that that would be part of our lives every day. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and replacing the temple with yourself, your body, making us, giving us the true temple. You are the head of the church. You are the builder of that church. You have brought us into yourself so that each and every day, whether we always feel it or notice it or like it or not, we are part of your family. It's like being married. God, you have made us your very own whether we always behave that way, whether we always like it or not, whether it always seems happy to us or not, we are your people. Lord, we ask that you would, would make your church holy, would make your church your beacon in this world of grace, of beauty, of glory, of power, so that people would be ushered into your holy presence, so that people would be brought to you to know you, not just as a consuming fire, but as a protecting fire, the fire that saves us from all of the dangers of our lives. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.